if you'll go ahead and join together in your bulletin or up on the screens, we're going to be reading a psalm, uh, psalm together. If you can go ahead and read the bold print, I'll go ahead and read the, the light print. Also, one of the things, next Sunday is also Sunday Sunday, which means that um, after our HCI vote, we're going to be having all, all sorts of ice cream and goodies outside and a great time of fellowship. So next Sunday, come not only for a great time of worship, come for engaging in the vote, but also come for engaging in some of that uh, good ice cream and good fellowship together. But let us join together in our call to worship. God, like a shepherd, you lead us to quiet waters and fresh grass. For the sheep that that follow and the the ones ones that that run away, your your love love is equal. equal. You lead us all so we can know love. You You walk us through life's valleys and peaks. Lead us so we know our house dwells eternally with you. Let us join together in singing our hymns of praise. 2031, we bring the sacrifice of praise. And 2171, make me a channel of your peace. You can find those in the Faith We Sing hymnals, or you can see the words up on the screen. Let us join together in song. to 
eternal life. <clears throat> Let us now join together in praying the unison prayer. Let us pray. In a world with so many different paths, getting lost is so very easy. It is easy to become self-centered, easy to get away from anything that deals with community, easy to get so focused inward that reaching out becomes an impossible dream. Yet we have a reaching out God who wants to fill us with that type of love. We have a reaching out God who wants us to be bringers and birthers of grace. So fill us, Christ, with your reaching presence so we can accept our claim as children of the kingdom of God. In Christ's name, amen. The children can now come forward for the children's sermon. Uh, I tell you what, we might just have the one here today. Have we got some others coming up or no? Maybe so? No? Actually, it's all right. Or right, there we go. So I tell you what. What? <laughs> Do you, you, you like my hat? You like that? You think that's pretty cool? Daddy. Nice and yellow, huh? Hope it doesn't mess up the hair. <laughs> Do you guys like my hat? Did anyone know what type of hat this is? Fire hat. A fire hat. That's a good guess. Anyone else? You want to guess what kind of hat it is? It's a construction hat. Do you guys have any idea why I'd be wearing a construction hat? I'm wearing a construction hat because, well, today's Mother's Day. Yep. And you know what a mother's job, you know what one of the tasks, many tasks of a mother job is, job, mother's job is? You know, sometimes you think, sometimes we think a mom's job is to make you happy. And moms do. do, do, do does, your mom, does your mom make you happy? Yeah. It's a good thing, isn't it? But one of the most important jobs is, is that, you know what, you know what, well, really what a parent is. Okay. And really is to share in the heart of God. Because God looks down at all of, all of God's creation, and God looks at you and says, I see in you, in you, in you, and all those out there, I see the very best that you can be. I see a light that can shine and shine to bless others. And so part of the task of a loving, caring parent is is simply to help you to be the best that you can be. And sometimes that means just embracing and loving you. Other times it means helping, helping you to take responsibility for who you are so you can grow to take responsibility and help others. And sometimes that process is not always easy. Have any of you ever built a fort with Legos? You guys are like blocks? It's not easy sometimes to build something up, is it? And it's the same way with the person. Is sometimes we, you know, sometimes our pieces don't always work and fit together. And so sometimes that love that gets shared is not always easy. But I hope you know that you have not only a God that loves you, but you have parents that want you to be the best that you can be. So you can always be under construction. <laughs> oh, it's like, leave me alone. <laughs> Do you like the hat, though? That is a cool hat. So let us pray that we have a God that's not only there for us, not only just loves us, but is helping us to continually grow in being the best that we can be in loving each other. Let us pray. God Almighty, just thank you for the ways that you love us, that you bring people into our lives. Sometimes it's parents, sometimes it's mentors, sometimes it's the church family, 
But we praise you, Lord, for how, Lord, you continue to mold and shape our lives, not only through the grace of your word and your presence in prayer, but through the grace of brothers and sisters and people around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And one of the things that I'd like to do right now as well is, did you, did you all know that today is the 100th anniversary of Mother's Day? A hundred years of celebrating moms. And so what we're going to do is just have a short video that kind of just goes through and shares a little bit about mom's love. You guys can walk back to Let's go back to that little place Where we used to go in the summer days The lodge by the water still my favorite place And I could come every year and it wouldn't change Thank you for the many steps that you follow us through. Thank you for the love and grace that enables you to be a blessing through many different stages and walks of life. Thank you, mothers. Let us join together in praising God for what we have and the love that we get to see in this world as we listen to the choir sing.
Well, praise the Lord. And let us join together now in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, on this Mother's Day, we are reminded that we are called to be part of your family. One of the most incredible images that you give to us is one of a parent to understand you as a leader and guider and molder and shaper of what binds us together, intertwines us, not only just those who gather here, but all of humanity under your common grace, love, and depths of who you are. And so, Lord, as we gather together here to celebrate mothers, we are reminded, Lord, that we are here because of your love and your grace and your mercy. But in being here, we know that we are not always perfect. And so for some, that we come here on this day, and it is a day of celebration, a day of remembering just so many good and great memories. But for others, it is also a day of incredible pain, pain and anguish because of their experiences, the love that was missed out on, the separation that exists, pain because ones that they love, be it either mothers or children, are no longer present or here. And so, Lord, we come to you on this day we realize that just like in life, there is things to praise and there is also things to mourn. And we thank you that you are a God that embraces us where we're at and that we as a family could come together in one common day and one common time of worship and yet be experiencing loads of different emotions and different things that are taking place in our life. And we pray for those who are going through struggles and difficulties. Pray for the 300 mothers and parents, and families, and communities that are mourning the loss of 300 girls taken into captivity. But it also reminds us, Lord, that there are millions and millions of women that are captured and put into slavery around the world. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to make decisions. Help us to make decisions that don't perpetuate this slave train. Help us to be wise about what our eyes look at because we make decisions that impact even over the computer screens and how we live our lives here. Impact the slavery and bondage that others can experience and go through. So Lord, help us to be holy as you are holy, loving as you are loving realizing that, Lord, we have been blessed to be intertwined, not only to you, but with brothers and sisters and everyone around the world. We pray for peace where there is war. We pray for food where there is hunger. We pray for water where there is thirst. And we pray for your outreach and extending arms of love where there is loneliness. So help us, Lord, to be those neighbors that are filled with your love, reaching out to others as you have reached out to us through Jesus Christ, doing so not out of a sense of must and have, but out of a sense of realizing that we are family, molded and shaped by grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And now we join together saying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now join together and sing the song, You Are My King. If you're interested in having the notes, we do have the notes available in little songbooks on the back or on the side of the sanctuary. Otherwise, you can follow along with the words right up front. So if you can join together, all who are available, if you'll stand, let us join together in singing, You Are My King.
I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? The scripture lesson today comes from Luke 15, verses 11 through 24. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his field to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself and said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and make merry for this is for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to make merry the word of god for the people of god
You know, on this Mother's Day, I have a question for you. What is it that makes us family? What binds you to the ones you love, that you call your own? What is it that makes family? Is it DNA? Is it the fact that you just gave birth and that they have a part of your DNA and because they have a part of your DNA that you need to honor them, care for them, nurture them? Is that what really makes this family? Is that what makes somebody important? It's because they have a piece of us. And in order for our legacy, our tradition, the depths of who we are, that it needs to be carried on. Or is makes us family the fact that we're willing to tolerate these people over the holidays. <laughs> you know, family gatherings, they get together. You know, how long is it before all of a sudden that tolerance is hard? Three days? Four? Five? Six? What makes us family? What makes one family and what does it mean to have children? What does it mean to call somebody brother, sister? See, the story of the prodigal son, Jesus is preaching, and he's preaching it to two different people groups. He's preaching it to the tax collectors and the sinners and the Pharisees and the scribes. I mean, you couldn't have two people that are more different from each other. One group of people is considered the unclean, the filthy. They have made life choices and decisions or have been forced to make life choices and decisions that separate them from the people of God. And you have this group of people that they're not just the people of God. These are the rock stars of the faith. The Pharisees and the scribes. I mean, these guys, they know the Bible. I mean, you sit there and you say, go through Isaiah chapter 14, pick a verse. They don't even have chapters, but they have it memorized. They can tell you the rest of it without even opening a book. Because in order to be a Pharisee or a scribe, you needed to have not just one book of the Bible, not just one verse. You need to have the whole thing memorized. These are the rock stars of the faith. These are the clean of the clean. And then there's these outcasts, these people that seem to flock to Jesus. And so Jesus starts sharing with them because he sees these people groups and he sees that this one group of people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're struggling because they don't understand how Jesus can tolerate and eat with and accept this group as being part of his family. And so Jesus is really, as he shares this message of the prodigal son, asking us to rethink family. Asking us to rethink what binds us to each other. What helps us to be intertwined and interconnected with those around us. He wants us not only to be better family to our, those who we are connected with by blood, but better family to those that we are connected to in, by the human race. And so he goes and he starts that story of the prodigal son. And so here's the story of that youngest son. The youngest son that, you know, says essentially is, is that I would want you to be dead. I want you dead to me is essentially what he tells his dad. I don't want to be part of this family. I want all that you have, all that you can offer, and I want it from you. Give it to me now. Now, 2,000 years ago, I have to tell you, this is no small thing. People didn't have bank accounts that they could all of a sudden clear out and say, here it is. Essentially, anyone who's listening to this story mean, knows that in order for him to accept his inheritance, it means, essentially, is that the dad would have to sell half of his land. Have you ever know, heard the, you know, the musical Oklahoma? You know, that the law, you know, essentially in the musical, you know, the, we don't belong to the land, you know, the, we, you know, we essentially belong to the land. That there's this deep relationship between the people and the land. 
this deep connection that land is not just something that you own, you belong to it. This land is stuff that gets passed down from generation to generation. This is something that, that you have, if you have land, if you have property, if you have a place, then this, this defines and helps define who you are. And so when all of a sudden the son is saying, I want half of what you have, essentially what he's saying is, I want you to sell half of who you are and give it to me. During this day and age, I want to tell you that the, the natural response of a parent during this day and age, the natural response of the father would have been, son, you're dead to me. The natural response would have been to kill the son for saying what he said. But it's interesting because essentially what Jesus says is that the father essentially says, okay, okay, go out on your journey. Go out and saying that you're dead to me. Here it is. You can have what you want. Now, for some of us, we're like, okay, I would never, ever do that to God or to anyone else, right? Tell God you want him dead. But yet, really what the path that the son is choosing is essentially saying, I want to do it my way. I don't care about your way. I want what you have to offer without having to listen and be in relationship with you. I mean, essentially, he's going on a journey where he's really, he's essentially saying, I want to do it my way. I'll go on my journey of self-discovery instead of family. Because sometimes, don't we want that? I want what God offers. I want a good life. I want heaven when I die. I want all these things. But Communion with God, be it prayer, worship, be it self-sacrifice. Well, those are things maybe I'd rather leave at the farm. I want it my way. Have you ever, any of you ever been on that journey? Where you, you really didn't say it out loud, but you, you really did it with your actions and the way you lived your life or the way that you have proceeded. I've been there. I've done that. Oh, there's days that go by. <laughs> In fact, I see myself wandering that path almost weekly. <laughs> where I want what God has to offer, I just don't want God. I don't want to work with God, connect with God, relate with God. Said, I just want to go on my own path. Do it my own way. Walk on that journey that just leads and goes and does things the way that I see fit. I don't need community. I don't need connection. I don't need relationship. So this journey that this son goes on leads to essentially his own destruction, his own downfall, his own, his own difficulties and struggle, struggles. I mean, it says that he essentially wastes it all, burns it all. And it's interesting that even after burning it all, wasting it all, going through it all, he decides that he wants to come back home. And it's interesting to see what he goes. Do you see, do you see when you look in the scripture and you read the scripture that it goes through essentially as, as he says, you know what, I'm going to go back as a hired hand. Now there's two things that he could say. It says, he's, you know, essentially there's two different types of positions. There's the position of a servant. Now a servant would be somebody who actually... Servants were commonly seen as being intertwined and interconnected to the family. They work for the family. They have to give of themselves to do the family. A hired hand is somebody that you bring in to do service and then you give money towards and you pay them. He wants to be a hired hand 
And so the thought here is, is that he wants to be a hired hand instead of a servant so that way he can pay back the impossible things that he was given from the dad. And doesn't that make sense? You take so much, you've got to give back so much. But Jesus changes and redefines what it means to be family when he talks about and when he shares the loving embrace of the Father. When he shares the loving embrace of the Father. Now, I think it's important to realize this. What, is, what does the Father do? He runs to him, right? Well, in this day and age where running is what we do for exercise, it doesn't seem to make... That's, no big deal. Dad runs to his son. That's what I would do. 2,000 years ago, the people would have heard that and they would have been like, oh. no, 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 you, you don't get it, Jesus. <laughs> men, men, heads of the household don't run. That is, that is not what, that's not what we do. That's not what people do. We don't run. You might run if you're in war or in battle, but outside of that, you do not run. That's not seen as socially acceptable. That is culturally against the rules. That is not what you do. It is unacceptable because that is what the person who is weak has to do. The person who is weak runs to the one who is strong, not the other way around. But what God says is essentially Jesus is saying, hey, you know what? You want to know, be part of my family? You want to know what my family rules are? Because essentially when Jesus is saying, I want you to be my disciple, is essentially saying, I want you to be like me. And to me, I'm like my father. And when the one that is lost, the one that is gone, the one that is difficulty, the one that is struggling, you want to know what I do? You want to know what I do? You want to know why the sinners and the left outs and the cast outs and the tax collectors are flocking to me? It's because I'm running to them. And I want you as my disciples to run to those who are the least, the lost, and the left out. And it's such a different experience of God, is it not? Do you see why the older brother struggles? Because his experience of God is following the rules. His experience of God is not living in the embrace. You know, one of the things that um, I'm continually learning and growing in as a parent is, is that, you know, you have that common vision and the common mission that you have for each child, that they be the very best them they can be and that you want to be part of helping to guide them to be the best them that they can be. But because each child has a different personality, a different makeup, you give them and you love them based upon what they need, who they are. What happens when we as a body become a group of people that are loved by God only one certain way instead of the vast differences. Some people get loved by experiencing things that go off in their brain. Others are loved based upon acts of service that they give to others. And others experience love at the fullest by this experience of God's embrace. All of us should experience all those realms because there's an experience of loving God with your heart, your mind, your soul, your body. And so there's that way that God loves us, but because we're made up and molded and shaped differently, we have the different experiences of who God is. I remember this girl, or this lady, she was telling me that, that we were talking about her struggles with church. And she was telling me, and she was going, and she goes, I want to tell you, and she grew up in a Methodist church. She goes, let me tell you what, what my struggle is. She goes, I went to a camp. She goes, I was living a life that was running away from God. And fortunately, this church, they sent me to camp. And she goes, I went to this camp, and she goes, I, 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 my experience was 
my experience at this camp was I encountered God in a way that went beyond my understanding. I encountered God in a way that literally changed and transformed my life. I went from going down one path to going down another because I experienced God. And she goes, the thing that hurt me about is because my experience was so radically different than some of my brothers and sisters that I went to. They didn't want to listen to me. In fact, even though I changed and was experienced transformation, she said I was almost cast aside. See, in God's embrace, it's sometimes hard for us especially to see that this embrace, this embrace that God gives to the prodigal son is one that breaks down barriers and boundaries. It says that God will reach out and love people based upon where they're at and what they need, not based upon our understanding, not based upon where we are at. God reaches out to people in radically and radically different and amazing ways. And our jobs as brothers and sisters is not to sense, essentially figure it all out. It's to actually to be like the Father and to lovingly embrace one another. Even those who have fallen away and have gone away and have struggled, to allow them to experience the depths of God's love through us, but also based upon where God and how God will reach and touch their lives based upon where they're at. The thing about the prodigal son story is it also breaks down some barriers that we have that sometimes start to exist, especially if we're living the quote-unquote good life. You know, when you're living the good life, it's very easy to believe in karma, you know, you get what you deserve. How many of you, when you read this story, think the youngest son going around with the unclean animals and the swine, that he got exactly what he deserved? I mean, come on. I know that when I read this story, I'm like, hey, come on now. This guy said, I want my father dead, and now he's... <laughs> You know, he's not swimming with the fishes. He's eating with the pigs. And, and isn't there kind of like this, he got a divine justice? And the, the reality is the world Jesus lived in, that's the world that he lives in. Divine justice. You see somebody poor on the streets, you don't feed them. Because they're there because that's where God wants them to be. It, for you to love them is almost to say you don't trust God. So Jesus, when he's sharing this story, says, hey, guess what? I don't live, you know my world? I love that son. And I want that son to experience the father's embrace. And I want you, my children, to be living out that embrace into this world And so I want you running. I want you breaking down the cultural boundaries, the ways that you think that you should act and behave. I want you to be willing to break those down in order to reach out to my children. Because the hurting and the pain, they may have made choices that helped to put them there, but it doesn't mean that they are any less loved. Help them to be who they are called to be. Help them to know who they're meant to be. Love them. Extend to them. Run to them when you see them. And instead of asking for payment, give grace. You know, what does it mean to be family? How do we live family out? At the heart and soul of it, it really 
is do we make choices in our daily lives to live in communion? Do we let God embrace us whether it be in prayer, whether it be in word, whether it be in service, whether it be in worship? Are you allowing God to embrace you or else are you running away? And maybe you've been living that running away life for a while, but may you know that you have a God that wants to embrace you in the depths of who you are. Or maybe you're like that oldest son who we'll talk a little bit more about next Sunday. And you're like, you know what? I've been living in my place, in my position, and I haven't been carrying that same love, the love that the Father has. It's willing to embrace others despite their different experience of God, despite their different place and position in this world. I need God to help me to realize and to know and to connect with those who are different than me. You know, that's one of the things that will be taking place. We vote yes on that HCI. It's just that the idea is getting together and to hear each other's stories. Stories of life and faith and journeys together. So that way when we look at each other, it can see See family above all. See God's grace moving in each and every one of us so we can extend grace to this community and to the world around. So wherever you are at, may you take this time to let God's love embrace you and mold you and shape you. May you take time to let God carry you not only into his arms, but allow you as well to be those arms that reach out in this world. Let us now join together and let us sing. King of heaven, the offering will be taking place at this time.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the many reasons why we gather here today. The love that you've placed and put upon our hearts that brings us together as your family. And Lord, we thank you for the many gifts that you've given us in people, whether it be physical family or whether it be family connected through you, for those neighbors that surround us. We ask and pray, Lord, that you fill us with your grace and your wisdom, that you take these gifts and these offerings, but you take also the gifts and offerings of our lives and you allow them, Lord, to share your embrace. So heal us where we need healing. Anoint us where we need anointing. Let us embrace as you embrace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's now join together with our closing hymn, Blessed Be Your Name. All who are able, please stand. We are blessed by a God who does run to us. Blessed by a God who wants relationship and connection with us. Blessed to send us forth as being those arms of embrace to the world. So anoint us, Lord, as we go forth today. Help us to embrace those we call family and those who are brothers and sisters by your grace. Amen.